varieties of heroism. A point to which we have often drawn the attention of our readers is that examination of the topic of inner race is worthwhile, however incomplete it may remain at this stage, because of the fact that, rather than just noting the occurrence or non-occurrence of struggle and death among a people, it is necessary to consider their distinct style and attitude regarding these phenomena, and the distinct meanings which they may give to struggle and heroic sacrifice at any particular time. In fact, at least in general terms, we can speak of a scale along which individual nations may be placed according to how the value of human life is measured by them. The vicissitudes of this war have exposed contrasts in this respect, which we would like to discuss briefly here. We shall limit ourselves essentially to the extreme cases represented respectively by Russia and Japan. Bolshevik Sub-Personhood It is now well known that Soviet Russia's conduct of war does not attach the slightest importance to human life or to humanity as such. For them, the combatants are nothing but human material in the most brutal sense of this sinister expression, a sense which, unfortunately, has now become widespread in a certain sort of military literature, a material to which no particular attention need be given and which, therefore, they need not hesitate to sacrifice in the most pitiless way, providing they have an adequate supply of it to hand. In general, as recent events have shown, the Russian can always face death readily because of a sort of innate dark fatalism and human life has been cheap for a long time in Russia. However, in the current use of the Russian soldier as the rawest human fodder, we see also a logical consequence of Bolshevik thought, which has the most radical contempt for all values derived from the idea of personhood, and it tends to free the individual from this idea, which it regards as superstition, and from the bourgeois prejudice of the I and the mine, in order to reduce him to the status of a mechanical member of a collective whole which is the only thing which is regarded as important. From these facts, the possibility of a form of sacrifice in heroism, which we would call telluric and subpersonal, under the sign of the collective, omnipotent and faceless man, becomes apparent. The death of the Bolshevized man on the battlefield represents thus the logical culmination of the process of depersonalization and of the destruction of every qualitative and personal value which underlay the Bolshevik ideal of civilization all along. Here, what Eric Maria Remarque had tendentiously proposed in a book which became notorious as the comprehensive meaning of war can be accurately grasped, the tragic irrelevance of the individual in a situation where pure instinctuality, unleashed elemental forces, and subpersonal impulses gain ascendancy over all conceivable values and ideals. Indeed, the tragic nature of this is not even felt, precisely because the sense of personhood has already vanished. Every higher horizon is precluded and collectivization, even of the spiritual realm, has already struck deep roots in a new generation of fanatics, brought up on the words of Lenin and Stalin. We see here one specific form, albeit one almost incomprehensible to our European mentality, of readiness for death and self-sacrifice, which affords perhaps even a sinister joy in the destruction both of oneself and of others. The Japanese Mysticism of Combat Recent episodes of the Japanese War have made known to us a style of dying which, from this point of view, seems to have affinities with that of Bolshevik man, and that it appears to testify to the same contempt for the value of the individual and of personhood in general. Specifically, we have heard of Japanese airmen who, their planes loaded with bombs, hurl themselves deliberately upon their targets, and of soldiers who place mines and are doomed to die in their action, and it seems that a formal body of these volunteers for death has been in existence in Japan for a long time. Once again, there is something in this which is hardly comprehensible to the Western mind. However, if we try to understand the most intimate aspects of this extreme form of heroism, we find values which present a perfect antithesis to those of the lightless, telluric heroism of Bolshevik man. The premises here are, in fact, of a rigorously religious, or, to put it better, an ascetic and mystical character. We do not mean this in the most obvious and external sense, that is, as referring to the fact that in Japan the religious idea and the imperial idea are one and the same thing, so that service to the emperor is regarded as a form of divine service, and self-sacrifice for the tenno and the state has the same value as the sacrifice of a missionary or martyr, but in an absolutely active and combative sense. These are certainly aspects of the Japanese political religious idea. However, a more intimate explanation of the new phenomena must be looked for, 
on a higher plane than this in the vision of the world and of life proper to Buddhism and above all to the Zen school, which has been rightly defined as the religion of the samurai, that is, of the Japanese warrior caste. This vision of the world and of life really strives to lift the possessor's sense of his own true identity to a transcendental plane, leaving to the individual and his earthly life a merely relative meaning and reality. The first notable aspect of this is the feeling of coming from afar, that is, that earthly life is only an episode. Its beginning and ending are not themselves to be found here. It has remote causes. It is held in tension by a force which will express itself subsequently in other destinies until supreme liberation. The second notable aspect related to the first is that the reality of the I in simple human terms is denied. The term person refers itself back to the meaning that it originally had in Latin, namely the mask of an actor. That is, a given way of appearing, a manifestation. Behind this, according to Zen, that is, the religion of the samurai, there is something incomprehensible and uncontrollable, infinite in itself and capable of infinite forms, so that it is called symbolically sunya, meaning empty, as against everything which is materially substantial and bound to specific form. We see here the outline of the basis for a heroism which can be called suprapersonal, whereas the Bolshevik one was, contrarily, sub-personal. One could take hold of one's own life and cast it away at its most intense moment out of a superabundance in the certainty of an external existence and of the indestructibility of what, never having had a beginning, cannot have an end. What may seem extreme to a certain Western mentality becomes natural, clear, and obvious here. One cannot even speak here of tragedy, but for the opposite reason to that which applied in the case of Bolshevism. One cannot speak of tragedy because of the lived sense of the irrelevance of the individual in the light of the possession of a meaning and a force which, in life, goes beyond life. It is a heroism which we could almost call Olympian. And here, incidentally, we may remark on the dilettante triviality of one author who, in a certain article, has tried to demonstrate in four lines the pernicious character which such views opposed to those which hold that earthly existence is unique and irrevocable, must have for the idea of the state and service to the state. Japan offers the most categorical refutation of such wild imaginings, and the vigor with which our ally Japan wages her heroic and victorious battle demonstrates, on the contrary, the enormous warrior-like and spiritual potential which can proceed from the living feeling of transcendence and supra-personhood to which we have referred. Roman Dovotio here it is appropriate to emphasize that, if the acknowledgement of the value of personhood is peculiar to the modern West, what is also peculiar to it is an almost superstitious emphasis on the importance of upbringing, which under recent conditions of democratization has given rise to the famous concept of human rights and to a series of socialistic, democratic, and humanistic superstitions. Along with this clearly less than positive aspect, there has been equal emphasis on the tragic, not to say Promethean, conception which again represents a fall in level. In opposition to all this, we must recall the Olympian ideals for our most ancient and purest traditions. We will then be able to conceive as equally ours an aristocratic heroism, free from passion, proper to beings whose life center is truly on a higher plane from which they are able to hurl themselves beyond any tragedy, beyond any tie, and any anguish as irresistible forces. Here, a little historical reminiscence is called for. Although this is not widely known, our ancient Roman traditions contain motifs concerning the disinterested, heroic offering of one's own person in the name of the state for the purpose of victory analogous to those which we have seen in the Japanese mysticism of combat. We are alluding to the so-called devotio. Its presuppositions are equally sacred. What acts in it is the general belief of the traditional man that invisible forces are at work behind the visible ones and that man, in his turn, can influence them. According to the ancient Roman ritual of Devotio, as we understand it, a warrior, and above all a chieftain, can facilitate victory by means of a mysterious unleashing of forces determined by the deliberate sacrifice of his own person, combined with the will not to come out of the fray alive. Let us recall the execution of this ritual by Consul Decius in the war against the Latins, 340 BC, and also the repetition of it, exalted by Cicero, by two other members of the same family. This ritual had its own precise ceremony, testifying to the perfect knowledge and lucidity of this heroic sacrificial offer. In proper, hierarchical order, first the Olympian divinities of the Roman state, Janus, Jupiter, Quirinus, and then immediately following this, the god of war, 
Pather Mars, and then, finally, certain indigenous gods were invoked. Gods, it is said, which confer power to heroes over their enemies. By the virtue of the sacrifice which these ancient Romans proposed to perform, the gods were called upon to grant strength and victory to the Roman people, the Curitus, and affect the enemies of the Roman people, the Curitus, with terror, dismay, and death. Proposed by the Pontifex, the words of this formula were uttered by the warrior, arrayed in the Praetesta, his foot upon a javelin. After that, he plunged into the fray to die. Incidentally, here the transformation of the sense of the word devotio must be noticed. While it applied originally to this order of ideas, that is, to a heroic, sacrificial, and evocative action, in the later empire, it came to mean simply the fidelity of the citizen and his scrupulousness in making his payments to the state treasury. As Boucher Leclerc puts it, in the end, after Caesar was replaced by the Christian God, devotio means simply religiosity, the faith ready for all sacrifices, and then, in a further degeneration of the expression, devotion in the common sense of the word, that is, constant concern for salvation, affirmed in a meticulous and tremulous practice of the cult. Leaving this aside, in the ancient Roman devotio we find, as we have shown, very precise signs of a mysticism aware of heroism and of sacrifice, binding the feeling of a supernatural and superhuman reality, tightly to the will to struggle with dedication in the name of one's own chieftain, one's own state, and one's own race. There are plenty of testimonies to an Olympian feeling of combat and victory peculiar to our ancient traditions. We have discussed this extensively elsewhere. Let us only recall here that in the testimony of the triumph, the victorious displayed in Rome the insignia of the Olympian god to indicate the real force within him which had brought about his victory. Let us recall also that beyond the mortal Caesar, Romanity worshipped Caesar as perennial victor, that is, as a sort of superpersonal force of Roman destiny. Thus, if succeeding times have made other views prevail, the most ancient traditions still show us that the ideal of an Olympian heroism has been our ideal as well, and that our people have also experienced the absolute offering, the consummation of their whole existence in a force hurled against the enemy in a gesture which justifies the most complete evocation of abysmal forces, and which brings about, finally, a victory which transforms the victors and enables their participation in suprapersonal and fatal powers. And so, in our heritage, points of reference are indicated which stand in radical opposition to the subpersonal and collectivist heroism we discussed above. And not only to that, but to every tragic and irrational vision which ignores what is stronger than fire and iron, and stronger than life and death.